Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today on another session of WeConnect Academy, learning from women leaders around the world series. My name is Andrea, and today I am very happy to introduce Tanya Walker. She is the founder and managing partner of Walker Law Professional Corporation. It is a WeConnect International certified company based in Toronto, specializing in all facets of civil litigation. She was recognized as WBE of the Year by WeConnect International in 2018. So it is a real honor to have her here with us today. This webinar is going to cover all aspects of negotiations and contracts to effectively build relationships that result in successful business negotiations. I'll let Tanya introduce herself and share more about her work, but I would like to remind all attendees that you are in listen-only mode. So if you have any questions, please write them down in the Q&A box that you will find on the GoToWebinar control panel at the right hand of your screen. I will make sure to read them out loud once the webinar is completed. We encourage you to do as many questions as possible. The recording of this webinar will also be available after today's session and will, it will be emailed to all attendees. It will also be available on our YouTube channel. Thank you, Tana, for being here with us today. Over to you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here uh, today. Um, today, I will discuss the impact of COVID-19 on negotiations. I will discuss how to build relationships to assist with negotiations with the added hurdle of COVID-19 and the lack of face-to-face -face meetings. I will further discuss contractual concepts that you should take into account when negotiating contracts to help you if there's another pandemic or recession that happens. Before I begin, I would like to thank WeConnect International for being able to have the ability to share my knowledge with all of you. We have been certified with WeConnect International for almost five years now. And also, if you enjoy this webinar, I encourage you to participate in our webinar next week, Walker Law's webinar on property law. There are COVID-19 property law issues that affect all of us around the world and many of the issues are similar. So we will be hosting a webinar next week. The registration link is in that photo before you, but if you do want a copy of that link sent to you so you can register, please send me an email and I'll respond right away with a link so you may register. Now our agenda today is as follows. First, I'll introduce our firm a little bit. The second is I'll get into the objectives of this webinar. Third, I'll speak about the impact of COVID-19 on uh, negotiations with corporates or suppliers, BATNA, also building relationships to assist with those negotiations, and lastly, contracts and legal phrases that should be included in your contracts when you're negotiating, knowing what you know now about COVID-19. Lastly, I will answer questions that you may have and wrap it up. And my disclaimer for today is this, that this webinar is intended to be for general information purposes only, and it's not intended to be independent legal advice. So some information about me, um, and I appreciate the introduction. I graduated from McMaster University in, Tor in Hamilton in 2002 with a commerce degree, it's business, and minored in economics. I then attended Osgoode Hall in law school in Toronto and completed school there in 2005. I was licensed as a lawyer in 2006, in 2006 so I've been practicing for 14 years. I practice at two equivalent Bay Street firms, which many of you may know um, as Wall Street. Bay Street's the Wall Street of Canada before I opened Walker Law 10 years ago. And we have been very fortunate to receive numerous awards for our work. And one of the awards I'm most proud of was previously mentioned, the 2018 We Connect International Women's Business Enterprise of the Year Award. And that we were nominated by a Fortune 500 company that we represented and got judgment in favor of them. And so they nominated us for this award, which I attended as an event in Washington, D.C. to get the award. 
We are, I'm also, I also work with our law society, which some of you may know is their state bar. So when you have an issue with a lawyer, you may uh, express that to your state bar and they may suspend a lawyer or engage in some kind of disciplinary proceedings. And in our law society is older than Canada. It's right now 223 years old. And I was the first black female voted in as a bencher board of director with our state bar, which is a law society. I also appear on four television stations as a legal um, analyst, which are equivalent to CBS, NBC, and ABC. I would like to express a special thank you to Jordan Rotliff, who is an associate lawyer with our firm. He has been very instrumental in helping me prepare this presentation for today. He was uh, articling, he articled with us, which is an intern. You have to intern before you can practice law here. And he has been practicing with us ever since. So the objectives of this presentation is to understand the impact of COVID-19 on your negotiation strategies, your opportunities to build relationships with corporates or suppliers so that you may negotiate and phrases to include in your contract when you do negotiate. So part one, your negotiation strategy. Before COVID-19, there was a study published by Harvard Business Review that states that in higher level jobs, men on average earn $10,000 US dollars more than women. And one reason cited for this discrepancy is that there is a need to approach a negotiation, first of all, to approach it, second, with strategy and information. The problem some, is sometimes that we don't have access to that information. We don't always know how much a competitor is being paid. We don't always want to turn a com potential customer off. And we may be more concerned about the reduction in spending power because there is less money to spend on diverse companies. So, when I speak of negotiation, it's going to be uh, keeping in mind FATNA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And I'm going to emphasize the circumstances have changed now and we are now in a pandemic. We're in a crisis mode. So I will discuss with you how to negotiate with the thought in mind that we're in a bit of a crisis mode. So negotiating in a crisis may actually mean you may say yes to a contract that may be unprofitable or unrealistic to, to you or for you. So this part one of this webinar will discuss how to say yes and how to negotiate a contract when there is a crisis. Now, before really diving into that, I was when I was preparing, I also wanted to address some mistakes I've seen pre-COVID-19. I have attended many We Connect conferences and at these conferences, we actually participate in roundtables. And what that means is there's a someone who works for a corporation, usually in procur procurement, at the table with a few of us potential suppliers sitting at the table with them. And we have like a minute or two to introduce ourselves and what we do. And I've seen many mistakes um, with how the suppliers go about this, which I wanted to address because that that is the first step to negotiation, even just getting at the table. And so one thing that I've seen is suppliers sitting at the table who cannot demonstrate the need for their product or service. They also, they cannot dis dis distinguish themselves from competitors and they cannot scale. So, and what it really means is lack of research. When we go back to how we are and we are attending conferences, it's important to keep in mind to be able to even get through that door to negotiate, you have to demonstrate to the person sitting at the table why they should select your service or product among many others. An example of what we do at our firm is extensive research. We receive the, we receive the, the company um, far in advance for the conference we research to see which companies actually have a need for litigation services in Canada. We then uh, go on public records to find out what open cases there are, what closed cases we are, there are, and we find um, out if we have completed similar work for them. So when we have that one minute discussion, we make it, we try to make it worth their time. That information is accessible to us 
And so there might be, it might be limited what information is accessible to you. But I urge you that when we do start to participate back in conferences face-to-face -face, uh, to try and get to research a little bit to see and demonstrate to that person sitting at the table why they need you. And some of our clients include PayPal, Sodexo, United Rentals. And I, my thoughts are the reason why we were funneled to the in-house lawyer that works for the company is because we demonstrated to that person sitting at the table why there was a need for our product that we offer. So going to COVID-19 now, what motivates your purchase? I am going to use the example throughout this webinar of a face mask because um, too many examples confuse us a little bit and face masks are very relevant right now. And so right now, as we speak, there are countless negotiations going on across the world, in boardrooms, in school, government, the court, they're deliberating policies for social distancing, working remotely, teaching online, and purchasing sanitation products. And one deliberation that I believe many institutions are dealing with right now are the use of face masks. So that leads to this example. If you were going to purchase a face mask at Walmart, you would have a certain set of expectations about the product as opposed to a luxury retailer such as Tiffany and & Company. And that's because you have information. So if I were going to Walmart to buy a face mask and they said the face mask would cost $100 US, I'd probably say it costs too much. And if I went to Tiffany and & Company and I was told the face mask cost $5 US, then I would think it costs too little and I'd probably buy more. The twist of COVID-19 is our, our circumstances also uh, define the decision that we make. So if I were putting a twist on this example, if I were to go buy groceries this, today and I was told by the grocery store, in order to enter our store, you need to wear a face mask and we're not supplying them to you, then normally I would be okay by spending $5 US on a face mask but maybe my family needs food. And so I would probably even go up to maybe 20 US to buy a face mask with the thought in mind, I may need more in the future and I'm going to continue to search to find a, a, more, a, a more cost effective face mask. What that, what that leads to is the BATNA. And that's a negotiation that I just gave, example I gave to you, just that's inside my mind. What, is, what costs too much for a face mask? What costs too little for a face mask? Why I would spend more for a face mask with the thought in mind going out to try and find something cheaper. And so I can, dealing with business owners right now and, and using that face mask example, I can say um, from my experience, the current mistakes that people are making right now with negotiation is making decisions in a crisis. And in crisis mode. And so one mistake that is being made is that suppliers are saying yes right away to a contract without even reading it. They're just so happy to get the contract. And they're not discussing it, they're not negotiating it, and then they regret it right away. That leads to ethical shortcuts. So we may say a product is made of a certain material, you sign that contract and you realize it's not profitable for you at all to make that product with that certain material. So then you decide to use a least more least an ex, a material that's uh, cost less to you that might be not be the same that you contracted for. The last is because decisions are made in a crisis, people don't necessarily think long term. Whatever contracts you enter into today, whatever relationships you you work on today, that's a relationship that you want to continue on for the long term. We are in a crisis right now where this the way the world is may continue on until 2021. And so I um, encourage you when you are negotiating a contract to think of that relationship continuing on in the years to come. So what are some tips for you negotiating, period? Especially now we're in a mode or a frame of mind where there's a little bit of panic. First of all, don't panic. 
this will soon pass. Um, everything will get back to as normal as possible, but don't panic and properly prepare. If you are looking for a product or a supplier, what are your outside alternatives? If you're about to supply a product or service, what are their outside alternatives? What information do you need? Um, consider negotiating um, in a conciliatory way, not hard line. We are in a, a situation where um, people are more likely to negotiate with you if they understand where you're coming from. And so if you negotiate where you're, you think about where the other side is coming from, it's important to share that information. An example of that is you sign a contract to provide a good or service. Your, the corporate or the, the person you sign a contract with wants to pay you in 120 days after you supply the good or service. Maybe you can negotiate and ask to be paid within 30 days. And you can explain because the person that supplies, let's lose a face mask example, pulp is used to make face masks. So you can may want to explain the supplier that supplies pulp to you to make the face mask for them expects payment within 15 days. So therefore it's difficult for you to carry that expense for 120 days. Those type of negotiations where you provide a little bit of information to explain where you're coming from may go a long way. Also, when you properly prepare, think about your value add. Right now in our firm, our value add to our clients is the law on a different level because the laws are changing every day. We have federal law, uh, provincial law, and then municipal law. And we keep a spreadsheet and circulate that internally every day. And we know that our business clients do not have the time to keep up with this all every day. So what we do is, if there is a law that changes that affects that particular client, we let them know. We just send an email uh, and say, just so you know, this was uh, came into effect last night. It may affect you, just so, so you know. And that's a value add, keeping on top of the law. Webinars, e-newsletters, keeping people in the loop. That's our value add. So I have a point down here about shadow of the future. And shadow of the future means think about changes that are going, changes that are being made right now may become permanent. And the reason why I have that picture of the Pexi glass is because people, when you're purchasing that glass to separate the cashier from the consumer, the, th the buying process may be different. The thought process when you're buying this may be different if you are purchasing uh, glass to be used for a month versus two, three years, versus being permanent. And so the material, uh, the cost, um, the structure, the, everything will de depend on permanence, permanence versus temporary. And so when you're negotiating contracts, um, you really would should think of it as being a permanent contract, a permanent relationship. And if you think of it as being, as being a permanent relationship, then you may negotiate it in a different way. So BATNA in one sentence to summarize it is convincing the opposing side that you're able and willing to walk away. And so now you may be open to accepting a lower price or for your product or service, or even charging a higher price if it's something in demand. But you don't want, if your product or supply is in demand, to be like that face mask example where there's a high price charge, the person buys it and then continues on the hunt to look for something that's cheaper. So it, there's, al there's always a balance and the, the goal is to maintain or start a long-term relationship that will last far after COVID-19 is over. That leads into my second point, which is building relationships with COVID-19. Now, relationships, always assist with effective negotiations. People like to do business with people that they know, they trust, and they like. And so the challenge is that relationships are usually built on being face-to-face -face with each other, meeting at a conference, lunches and dinners. So how can you build a relationship with a corporate or another supplier while everyone's pretty much homebound? Now, to start off, I will give an example. An example is Stephanie Fontaine, who is the country
country director at We Connect International Canada. And I uh, applaud her because when COVID-19 started and people were really, really stressed out, she was one of the first people, uh, individuals to call me and say, how are you? How's everything going? And what can we do to help you? And I thought to myself, if I'm going to continue on to apply for any certification, this is an organization that I will continue with because they're supportive. And that's during a time of crisis or um, feeling uncertain, these are things that stand out in one's mind. So that's just an example of what we connected International did for our firm. So going into my point is the need, need to physically distance does not mean you should cease efforts to build relationships. Keeping in mind that we may not participate in another conference till next year, most of us cannot afford to quit developing or strengthening the relationship um, and put them on hold until then. You will not be top of mind if you just don't continue to, to work. So I'm going to offer you some tips on how to build and or strengthen relationships during the pandemic so it will make negotiations now and in the future easier. We just have to be a little flexible. And so here are my top five. The first is consider scheduling coffee via teleconference or even just, just meeting um, via video conference. Keep, keep the dialogue open. Continue to send tokens of appreciation, this time, perhaps if you can, by mail, such as swag. We have many promotional items in our office. And one thing that we do is when we host a webinar, we ask people to complete a survey after our webinar so we can improve. Those who complete a web, uh, survey are given the option of providing their address so we can mail a token of appreciation and tokens of appreciation that's applicable. So we sent Maple Walker Law, Maple Syrup, there are water bottles, pens, um, gift cards. So we, we continue to build a relationship even if it's not face-to-face. -face. Social media, I find that I, I am being approached about matters on different platforms, far outside email. So normally, I just check my email all the time. Now, it's WhatsApp, it's Instagram, it's LinkedIn, it's Facebook. People are approaching our firm in different ways to ask questions about the law or to get assistance. And, some, and many times, it's an area of law we don't even cover, such as wills and estate. People are thinking about wills in times like this, and it's just directing them to the right person. But people expect, generally, a very quick response time. So taking two or three days to respond to someone who writes who has written to me on Instagram or WhatsApp might not be seen as acceptable. I also update and comment on social media. And I'm and if you're comfortable, show people um, who you are as a person. Um, on my Instagram personal, I posted that I'm cooking more and I posted a meal. I'm not I've never done that before, but I thought to myself, I actually am doing this, I'm cooking a bit more and something is something that people might be able to connect with. And so I received it, uh, questions in my inbox. Where did you buy uh, um, the crab? I made crab cakes. Where did you buy the crab for the crab cakes? Um, I love this type of food. It's just building that connection. So then when you start going, you're, you meet face to face, people will not feel as if time has passed. Number four, inform people about topics that they care about. So what is your niche? What do you know or what can you learn to help assist people because they just don't have the time. Keeping in mind, we're also managing working from home. Many of us are homeschooling um, our children, uh, worried about family and friends we haven't seen for a long time. We don't have as much time to educate ourselves about certain topics that we may need education on. So maybe inform people about the topics that they really care about. And also continue to join associations. Um, we Connect is wonderful. We Connect actually connected me to another person who is another company across the country who is certified who needed our assistance and we are going to help her. And so keeping the dialogue open with associations such as Connect is, is 
incredible. I, we also um, joined another association for Caribbean professionals because my parents are Jamaican. I was born in Toronto. And they have scheduled um, almost every week just a meetup, just for an hour on the weekend. And it's a good way to get out there and meet people from the comfort of your home. So webinars are relevant and well rehearsed. They're important. There are many webinars going on every single day. And so you have to make sure that if you decide to host one, you make it worth the time of the participants. So going into part three, which is legal considerations, I'm going to speak a, li a little bit about what legal considerations you should take into, a into account when you're negotiating. We have been approached by people who unfortunately haven't, don't have the right, the phrases that assist them right now in time of need. And I understand I'm a lawyer, but I'm also a business person. And sometimes business people, we get very busy and we don't necessarily take the time that we need to, to thoroughly review that 15 page contract and edit it. But it's important to do so. And if you haven't, it's never too late. I urge you that if you have a contract that you want to negotiate, you should try to negotiate it. We have negotiated many contracts since COVID-19 has started um, that we entered into before COVID-19. And everyone that we renegotiated contracts with has been very, very cooperative. So one example of a phrase that you should make sure going forward at the very least that is in your contract is this phrase called a force majeure. And what it means is a superior force. What it is, is a phrase in your contract that addresses scenarios beyond your control that may prevent you from meeting your obligations. So this is an example of a phrase that was in a case. And so I'll give you examples of how this works because it is a little bit complicated. Um, but it, it's basically saying in a situation where there's COVID-19 and I can't supply you what I agreed to supply you, um, that you will not uh, sue me for any damages or any losses because I couldn't supply you what you need because I couldn't supply it to you, not because I was wrong, it's because of the circumstances. Maybe I'm a non-essential business and I'm not even allowed to operate. So therefore, please don't blame me for not supplying to you what you need. That's what it really stands for. It's superior force beyond your control. And you can see in this paragraph, I highlighted in red, pandemic. The World Health Organization has called this a pandemic. So if you had a phrase in your paragraph that says, includes the word pandemic, you may be able to rely on it if you are unable to fulfill your responsibility. So two examples of, of the, these type of phrases. I'll give you examples because um, it, it is quite complicated. The first is Frederick Transport Limited versus Gakel Systems Limited. It's a case. And what happened here is one trucking company said to another, if there's any delay in shipping our product, shipping to you due to the fact that we are waiting on government permits, please do not sue us because it's not our fault. That's what it, it essentially said. And in this situation, that's what happened. Truck was crossing the border from Canada to United States. There was a delay with getting a government permit. And so they said, please don't sue us. The judge ended up in court anyway. And the judge said, you know what, they're really not in the wrong because you have a, a phrase in your contract that contemplates this external force, a delay with the government permits, and, it's, and, it, and that's what happened. So you can't get upset with them. The second is, um, example is Fishery Products International Limited versus Midland Transport Limited. And it says here um, in that situation, if there is a strike, then there's a delay because of that and a strike is internal, there are employees striking, please do not uh, sue us for any delays because of a strike. So what happened in this situation is that there was a protest. They're delivering the product, there is a protest on the road, and as a result, they weren't able, there was a delay in getting the product. They said to a judge, it's the same thing as a strike. A judge said, no, it's not. If you want um, your responsibilities 
um, to be put to the side because of a protest, that's what you should have in your contract. So you have to make sure that if you decide to negotiate a phrase in your contract that deals with strikes, protests, anything of that nature, it has to be very, very specific because judges are not likely to rewrite contracts between business people. Other examples of force majeure is our leases, commercial leases. We're dealing with a lot of issues with leases nowadays. And um, if you were, if you're uh, a tenant and you're not, you're having difficulty paying rent because you're ordered to be closed. If you have a paragraph in your contract that speaks to this and not pay, having to pay rent if you're ordered to be closed, then it's very difficult for your landlord to change the locks on you. So these are just two examples. I understand that this presentation will be circulated afterwards, so you can read them more in detail afterwards. Now, when you, if you are, if you do have a paragraph like this in your contract, how do you use it? First of all, keep in mind, I'm a trial lawyer. I love going to trial, but I, I, I my job as an advocate for my clients is to try to settle. 95% of our cases settle. And so, we, it's difficult to settle or, or do anything on handshakes. I can't prove handshakes later down the line to a judge. Most important thing is if you're going to rely on any paragraph in your contract, regardless if it's a force majeure paragraph, make sure you write, you send an email and you put it in writing. I'm going to rely on this to not be, because I can't fulfill my obligation. And this is what it says. There's a, the reason is COVID-19. The impact is I'm a non-essential business and I can't operate and there and this was outside of my control. If you're on the other side and you don't believe that this paragraph even applies, then what are you doing to minimize your losses, right? So if you are that, that strike protest example with the truck and you're saying, well, you know what, our, par our phrase speaks about um, a strike not a protest, which are two completely different things, so I don't agree with you, you are expected by a judge in most jurisdictions to go out there and get an alternate supply if you can. And then you should, if you are going to sue, you sue for the difference in price that you had to pay. Always try to minimize your losses. If you are relying on a, a phrase in your contract that says, um, I am... Um, I can't pay rent, and the landlord says, no, you should. This phrase doesn't apply, and you believe it applies. Most of the courts, they're, right now, they're limited in what they can do. If you can, pay the rent. Then you can go to court later on and say, I want a return of the rent I pay because this phrase applies in our contract. So taking other phrases that you should take into consideration when you are negotiating is an escalator phrase. An escalator phrase is something that's tied to your business needs. An example of this is rent. I, uh, you may want to consider rent tied to profit. It's a little bit intrusive because then you would have to produce the documents, but you might want to say, okay, well, my rent is 2% of profit. So then if you have a month that like this, where you might not have profited or profited very little, you don't have to pay rent. It's called an escalator phrase. Contingency phrases are similar to what I've explained before, force majeure, but it really ties it to an external metric. So it just says, um, as long as the supplier, let's go back to face masks. As long as the supplier of my product, uh, face masks, say pulp, charges a dollar for the pulp, I will charge you $5. But if my supplier charges more, we have the right to revisit this and, and maybe peg it to how much is being charged. Uh, speaking about negotiations as well, if you enter into a contract you're not completely comfortable with um, and you're thinking about the big picture, you could also ask to revisit it in six months. Let's enter into this and with the right to amend the terms in six months. Other terms you may want to consider in your contract is the entire agreement phrase. Entire agreement phrase means that um, side agreements may not be counted. So you may have your contract that's two or three pages, both of you sign it, you agree on something else later on in an email, um, but it doesn't form that part of your contract. It may, 
it may not be seen down the line as being part of your contract. It's a little bit complicated, but you should make sure that you include this phrase in your contract. And if you don't, if you're going to agree on other things later on, you shouldn't have the phrase in there. Also, with, with contracts, how it works is if your contract is 10 paragraphs and then for some reason a judge disagrees with one paragraph and deletes it, the other, the contract could be seen as not being active and so null and void. And so you want to have a paragraph that says, for whatever reason, if we end up in court and a judge decides to delete this paragraph, then the rest of the contract is alive. Thirdly, choice of law. I see this a lot, especially when I receive contracts from uh, corporate clients because they retain law firms all over the world. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that the contract that they provide to us is customized for us. And so choice of law means is if we have a dispute, a legal dispute, where, what, what law governs us? So I've seen contracts that say Delaware, California, France, and I am not familiar with those laws. I'm not entering a contract based on any familiarity with those laws. So I ask for that to be changed to Ontario because that's where we are. You also, another mistake I often see is that um, choice of forum. So where are you going to argue your dispute if you have one? Are you going to use arbitration? Arbitration is a private um, person that is paid like a judge to decide your dispute. Many contracts that I've received say disputes are going to be dealt with in arbitration. But then when the person comes to me, they don't want to deal with it in arbitration. They want to go to court. You can't go to court because you have that paragraph in your contract. Also, if you have arbitration, who, how are you going to decide who the arbitrator is going to be? What rules, court rules are you going to use? Like it's, it's a bit complicated. So choice of law, um, first of all, should really you should try to have it in the jurisdiction where you are. And second of all, if you have arbitration, you should try to iron out what's going to happen um, if, you, if you decide to proceed that way. Also, in some places, you may want to consider pegging the currency. Pegging the currency means that um, your dollar may be worth 20 cents six months from now. So you may sign a contract that says, I will supply you that face mask for one, you, for one uh, I'll use the example, Canadian dollar. And then the Canadian dollar is worth 20 cents in December. If I am concerned about the fluctuations in our currency, I may just want to agree to supply to you the face mask for a currency that might not fluctuate as much, say the US dollar or the Euro. So it's important to keep that in mind, depending on where you are. So to conclude, um, I would like you to uh, understand that negotiations are very important and try to see, keep a frame of mind where you're not negotiating in crisis mode. The second is, um, if, you, if someone tries to renegotiate with you, at least be open to it and think about long-term, that relationship you want to have at this point in 2021. Developing relationships, take advantage of the technology that's available. When I opened this firm 10 years ago, I was not aware of so many like video conferencing and WhatsApp. It might have been around. I was just not aware of it. And, and, and we are more aware of technology and the use of it to help build a relationship. Lastly, contract. Knowing what you know now about a pandemic or even maybe even a recession, try to approach contract negotiations where a lawsuit is less likely to happen if the contract has certain phrases. What my recommendations are based on just keeping you out of court. So for those of you who joined us a little bit later, um, I mentioned that next week we will be, Jordan and I will discuss uh, property law and property law issues that have come up. An um, example of that that I've seen is that people are selling houses by video. So the real estate agent is showing a house um, or buy video, and then people may purchase that house or property by just looking at a video. They're not actually going into the home. So what are the problems that I can see from that? If there are certain cracks, if there are foundation issues, certain things that may not be shown on the videotape, um, that might be an issue down the line. And so we will discuss 
such issues. And I hope that you join us. If the link is there, if you want, uh, you can send me an email and I'll just respond right away with the link so you can just click on it and register. I urge you to register. So now I will answer any questions you, you may have. Yes, thank you so much, Tanya. This has been uh, very helpful, I believe, for all the attendees. I would like to encourage everybody that to write down their questions. This is the moment. We have around 20 minutes to answer questions, so this is a great opportunity for you to get as much as possible out of this webinar. Uh, we have a question from Runal. Um, could you explain about grandfather clause in lease agreements? My understanding of a grandfather clause is um, relying on other clauses to continue on with the agreement. Like I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure, so I don't want to guess. Um, that that's my brief understanding of a grandfather clause. I see another question here, though. I see um, I'm a commercial tenant, and I'm concerned that I won't be able to meet my rent obligations. I don't think that I have a uh, forced majeure in my contract. Is there any way out of my commercial lease? Um, and so uh, what you may want to consider, there's another term called frustration. Um, and frustration means that the contract is just frustrated, like I, I can't complete my term of the contract. An example of that is um, many sports teams are not um, playing right now. They're not playing in the stadium. And so for a stadium to say, well, you are responsible for our loss in ticket sales, because you didn't play, um, they can probably come back and say, well, my contract was frustrated because of COVID-19. Um, we could not play in the stadium. So therefore, I can't be held responsible for you know, loss in revenue due to ticket sales. Got it. Thank you. I'm, I'm forwarding you the, the questions that I'm getting, but I'm, I, I'm gonna, I can read them out loud for the benefit of the, of the rest of the attendees. Um, okay. From Zoe, hi Tanya, can you refer to contract requirements for services? Uh, which clauses are critical for consulting services going forward? Um, contract requirement for services, taking into account, I'm just reading it, so which are critical for consulting services. Um, uh, I would think uh first is the payment how often are you going to be paid how um like when are you going to be paid because consulting takes time so are you going to be paid when you finish the actual project are you going to be paid every 30 days um do they have to verify that they're satisfied with the work that you've done in order to pay you or can you just submit the invoice um, that's one thing that's very important. The second is the consulting services. Where are the consulting services going to take place? Because I would assume that the consulting services would be um, provided remotely. Um, is there any expectation um, that they won't be provided remotely? Um, any expectations regarding meeting, report? Um, I would also, the definitely should be in there is if there are any disputes, um, how are you going to deal with your dispute? Um, are you going to have a, a, a forum? Are you going to have a forum where where it's arbitration? Who's going to pay for the arbitrator? Um, or are you going to deal with it in the courts? And what happens if the courts are not dealing with your matter right now? Or is there any other alternative way that you, you'll deal with that? Um, you probably would ask for reviews. Uh, you could have that in your contract where if they're satisfied with your work, they agree to give you a review, say, on LinkedIn or um, on Google because people are really relying on reviews. Usually when I travel, um, I look at TripAdvisor before I even uh, consider going to some somewhere or staying in a certain place because I want to see what other people have said about it. That's the same with you and what you provide. So I think those are really um, things you need to take into account for uh consulting services, um, you really should think about it as, I think of contracts of, as like a prenuptial agreement. 
I hope that you never really need to rely on certain terms or phrases, but they're there and we've worked them out just in case we need to. So really what can go wrong with this consulting uh, service um, type of arrangement that you have and make sure that's put down in the contract. Thank you so much. Another question from Adiola. Thank you for your amazing presentation. Um, what's the biggest source of renegotiations which you have experienced during the pandemic? Biggest source, like, sorry, I mean, I believe biggest it's, source. Yeah, like maybe reason for renegotiations. That's what she meant, probably. The reason. Uh, yeah, what's the biggest source of rene renegotiations? It's a little bit difficult for me to understand as well. But maybe we can move yes. to yeah, the reason. She's saying the reason. No, I can answer. Yeah, can I? Yeah. There, there's, I, the biggest reason, I would say, is money for re renegotiations. So it's money and it's uncertainty. So um, because you don't know for certain how much um, income or money you will generate, you look at what expenses you have and you say to those um, suppliers, could we nego renegotiate our contract because of the uncertainty I have? I don't want to get into a position where I'm in default. I'm not there yet. So if I don't want to get into a position where I'm in default, then I should um, renegotiate with you so I'm on the safe side. Uh, and then hopefully in a few months, we can go back to how things were. I think that's really the biggest source I see is is, um, is money. And the second is also uh, supplies. So if there aren't enough supplies and um, you need to supply someone else, so the face mask example, maybe the hospital or the government is telling you you have to supply this entity so then you can't fulfill your other contract, then you need to make... Um, them aware of this. But I, I think it's really just ultimately uncertainty um, with how the world is going and trying to prevent um, an impact on that relationship due to that uncertainty. Got it. Another question for Charlotta, from Charlotta. How can you change or amend the contract regarding how to address lawsuits that are favorable to the small business? And we change to be the party to decide how the lawsuit is addressed. If you're working as a subprime, how can you change the clause? You get paid when we get paid. I, I well, forward it back to you if it's easier for if it's okay. easier to read. Okay, thank you for doing that. Um, let me move that to the screen. So my my thoughts. My thoughts on that is um, you can you could always renegotiate contracts. And if you come to to that table to renegotiate the contract and you explain why, right? So you could say, I was very excited to get this contract from you and I really signed it without being as thorough as maybe I should have been or I didn't have legal advice at that point in time. Um, but now that I've had some time to think about it, I'd like to renegotiate this particular phrase. And the issue I or concern I have about this particular phrase is that you have the ultimate decision making um, on how any disputes will be dealt with. And although I don't anticipate us having any disputes, I need to I want to feel comfortable with what we've agreed to. And so therefore, I think that we should negotiate this phrase. Where, where both of us decide on where the dis how the disputes will be dealt with, or we just agree that we'll deal with the disputes in a court, and if both of us agree to arbitrate, then we'll arbitrate, and here are the names of three possibly arbitrators we can use, because then you can choose people who are more cost effective. Um, I, I think if you just approach it, it not it being, uh, as cooperative as possible, of explaining as much as possible, then it, they might be open to it as well. They might say, well, you already signed it, so it's too bad, but you have to, you at least try. Um, and who knows, you may be able to negotiate something else. You might 
the contract might be valid for five years and you if they say to you okay well it's too bad you take it or leave it you could say okay well I understand that maybe we can shorten the contract or maybe revisit this in two or three months because I know there's a lot going on um, but I just want um, you know to be fair and have a, com a contract that we're both comfortable with awesome I have another good question when it comes to employment agreements for employees currently working from home what do you think are the most important clauses that need to be added Employee agreements for employees. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading it now. I, so I think for for employees working from home, um, we have almost a 10 employees, uh, and there's not many of us here. There's like two or three of us here. So uh, working from home, it's important to set out expectations. Um, I have seen people work from home where they send out one email and they call that working from home. My expectation is if you say you're working from nine to five or eight to four, I will be able to get in touch with you from nine to five or eight to four. Um, I also think, so that should be in there. Um, antivirus um, protection, if depending on if they're using their own computer or a computer that you supply to them, that should be in there because you don't, It'd be very. Um, you don't want to get hacked, or show, or even not um, trying to prevent the hacking from happening. Um, phones. Uh, one of our corporate corporate clients, a Fortune 500, actually sent us a checklist of expectations that they expect us to have for our employees when they work from home. Um, and I'm happy to modify that to take out the name of that company, um, but to send that to you if you send to me your email address. But some of the things I saw were um, n not uh, not using any equipment that's personal, such as a, even a mouse, um, not using um, having a phone forwarded to a company phone. Uh, I think those are things that are very uh, important to have. And also reporting, right? So in Canada, if someone has COVID-19 as employers, you're actually supposed to report it. Uh, you, I would have the same expectation for someone who's working from home that if they have COVID-19, they actually will tell me. Um, and I would definitely make sure that's in a contract because then it's, even if you don't see them that often, um, you don't want, they're still working for you, so you still have to report it anyway. So I would think that's very, very um, important to have. You would, um, the, the hours of work, definitely, um, how often you report to work, if the person is expected to come into an office maybe once a week or off time, off peak hours, some of our employees who are lawyers, they need the banker's boxes. And so they will come in at um, on a Saturday night or a Friday evening after hours to pick up the boxes that they need because it's very difficult to sometimes prepare just electronically. Sometimes you just need the boxes. So I think those are a few things that um, an employee, you, you, should, you should have, um, in their clauses for the employee um, to have. Perfect. I have one uh, long questions here, uh, but it, it's probably good uh, if you can see it there in your, in yeah. your chat. Um, if a company based in country A is to be represented for sale of its products in another country, by company B, <laughs> and company A wants to work based on sales generated by company B wants to work based on monthly fixed fee plus part of sales margin, how can one negotiate the contract without a fixed monthly fee, but only on a sales margin, especially during, during these stressful times? And what if the party is not flexible on the term, on these terms? Any way to work around this situation or any advice to work around this situation that Kayan is facing? Yes, thank you, Kayan. I just want to I just want to make sure um, I and let me just make sure, check the time. OK, so. Company A, the company is based in country A. I like using real names. So let's say company is based in country A, USA. I don't, I don't know Kayan, so I'm just picking up countries. Um, if a company is based in country A, which say is USA, is to be represented for the sale of its product in another country by company B, so say Canada, and USA wants to work based on the sales generated 
sales generated, so it's like a commission. But Canada wants to work on a monthly fixed fee plus part of sales market margin. How can you negotiate the contract without a fixed monthly fee, but only on a sales mar margin, especially during such? Okay, so I understand. So Company A USA wants um, commission, and Company B says I want a fixed fee. That's what it essentially means to me. And so how do you how do you deal with that to get that person to agree? to uh, commissions because it's uncertain time. Um, and so what I would do in this situation is explain there's so much uncertainty and I'm concerned about this uncertainty and I don't want to be in a position where um, I agree to something that I can't pay or I can't afford. So what I'm, I like to do is to maybe um, have it on commission and perhaps consider a bonus based on maybe a uh, commission, but have the commission a little bit higher than what you may like, or just negotiate somehow, um, or have that commission and have a bonus based on the sales generated during a period of time, say three to four months. And then I would have the contract where we say, let's try this out for three to four months and see how it goes. Um, because, and then um, we can revisit it. And if I'm in a position where I feel more certain about being having the ability to pay you a fixed fee, then I'm happy to do that, right? And you can let that person know um, there's there's government initiatives, there's a lot of grants out there. So I during that time, I'm going to search around to see what I can do to satisfy both of us. Um, but this is what I kind of need right now. So I would try to see how we can meet in the middle. Okay, I'm looking at Zoe M. Did you want to read the question or did you want me to read it out? Uh, as you prefer, we have one last one from Zoe. If you maybe it's just better with time to just uh, read it out loud for you, yourself. Okay, so hi again for business partnerships. There's one actually we didn't get a chance to answer. But um, when it comes to employment, I'm just checking time, three minutes. So when it comes to employment agreements for employees currently working from home, oh, sorry, I missed that one. Hi again, for business partnerships such as a subcontractor for another consultant, do I need to have a separate contract for my intellectual property? How should I approach them with it? We've only signed a, a non-disclosure contract. Um, it depends if, you're, if your contract already has. So if you're saying here that um, so everyone can understand, you you are a subcontractor, um, do you, should you have, should you have a separate contract to protect your intellectual property, like I guess your product that you create, any trademarks, copyright, and how should you approach it with them? Um, you've only signed a non-disclosure agreement. So I think what you can say is I've been, I've had time to reevaluate the contract that I signed with you, and I realize that there's nothing in it that protects my intellectual property. Um, I would like us to include maybe a Schedule A, an Exhibit A, that speaks of protecting my intellectual property. Here is what I've been thinking of, if that's okay with you. And you keep in mind that you don't usually come in with your bottom line because you have to leave some room for negotiation. And because you want to, you, you don't want to walk away thinking that they have your intellectual property. You don't want them to think that they own your intellectual property. You want them to understand that the intellectual property belongs to you. So that's the way I would approach it. I, I usually, I would recommend um, approaching contract negotiations after you sign the contract with the understanding of that you've had a little bit more time to look th it through. And these are phrases that you like to renegotiate or you like more clarification on certain things that are not contained in that contract. Perfect. I oh, think we're sorry, there's time. What, there's, wait. No, we have one more we missed. Okay. So we have my independent friend. So Adolia, um, my independent fashion brand, Cultureville, is presently ma making fa face masks available for free to the public. In your experience, would this make it difficult to negotiate a good price when negotiating with re larger retailers? I I don't think so. I don't think that it's 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 it makes it difficult. It shows that there's a social cause and there's a social reason why you're doing this. Um, and so uh, I, I maybe now knowing what you know, 
you might want to ask, if you're making face masks available free to the public, you might want to ask them to perhaps donate money to the charity of your choice. But I, I think because there's such a social cause and such a need for these face masks, it won't make it difficult to negotiate a price when it comes to negotiating with large retailers because they're going to expect a certain quantity and they're going to expect uh, in a certain time period. And it's, it's really would be unfair to expect you not to um, not to be paid fairly for that. Awesome. I think we've covered everything, Tanya, and it's perfect timing. So I'm so proud of uh, how much, you know, you covered and it's amazing, great information. I, I think that everybody valued everything, all your input, all your advice. So thank you so much for your time and generosity. Um, for us, it's an honor, as I said at the beginning. Uh, just to remind everybody that um, Tanya's contact information is displayed right there if you have any follow-up questions. Also, the recording of this webinar is going to be available on our YouTube channel and also on a follow-up email that you will be receiving tomorrow. Thank you so much, Tanya, for your time and your work and all the work that you do. It's truly inspiring. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining today. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye.